The fossil record. Our roadmap looking through the fossil record will be this. First of all, the history of the world. We need to look at the history, how evolution describes it. We need to look at the history of the world as the Bible describes it. Then we'll go into the fossil record. We'll look at the fossil record in education. We'll look at something called the Cambrian explosion. Then we'll look at famous transitions used to support evolution. And then we'll finish it up with something called the mechanism for change, natural selection and mutations. So let's start with the history of the world. The evolution model postulates that about 4.6 billion years ago, this Earth evolved into existence all by natural processes. Then about 3.5 billion years ago, life evolved by natural processes. Then all species evolved over billions of years from a common ancestor. Then finally, the Earth was shaped by what we call uniformitarian processes over these billions of years. That is the history of the world based on the evolution idea. Now, the history of the world based on the Bible is very different. In Genesis 1.1, we read, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Then in Genesis 1.25, we read, And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And then in Genesis 6.17, we read, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under the heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. So we have two very different histories there. The evolution model says it's time, chance, and natural processes. Long periods of time. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created. He created the earth. He created the universe. The Bible teaches that God created all creatures after their kind. There was not one common ancestor everything evolved from. And then the Bible says, this earth was not shaped by long periods of time, uniformitarian processes. It was mostly shaped by a worldwide flood. So we have two different models. Now each model, the evolution model and creation, can be determined by evaluating the lines of evidence. And there'll be two lines of evidence we'll look at. One is called the fossil record, and the second one is the mechanism for change. Because if there's no mechanism for change, then the fossils have to be interpreted as being created after their kind. So let's start. One of the best evidences we have, again, to determine the truthfulness of evolution is the fossil record. Now, what does each model predict about the fossil record? Well, the evolution model predicts that we should have many, many intermediates, transitional forms all the way up through the fossil record. Transitional forms, creatures that are slowly evolving into some other creature. We should find many, many transitions. But the Bible, the creation model, clearly predicts and states there should be no intermediates. We should find genetic variability. For instance, dogs. We have many flavors of dogs, but they're dogs. Many types of, of people, shapes and sizes, but we're all people. So the two models have a very different prediction. Well, let's take a look at what Charles Darwin had to say about all this. Charles Darwin wrote, why is not every geologic formation in every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain, and this is the most obvious and serious objection which can be argued against the theory. So when Charles Darwin was coming out with his book, The Origin of Species, he made the statement he doesn't have any physical evidence to support his claim. No fossil record to support his claim. He can't find his intermediates. Well, where are we at today? Let's see what we find in intermediates. What kind of intermediates should we find? Well, we should find intermediates between single-cell organisms all the way up to very complex creatures like jellyfish and trilobites. We should find intermediates between invertebrae and vertebrae, invertebrae being those kind of creatures that we find mostly living in Washington, D.C., now, invertebrae are those kind of creatures, really, that don't have a hard backbone. Vertebrae are those kind of creatures that do have a hard, bony type backbone. We should find creatures out there that have half a backbone, quarter backbone, all the way up and down the line if evolution is true. We should find intermediates between fish and amphibians. We should find many, many creatures 
fish type creatures that are growing legs, half legs, quarter legs, all the way up to amphibians. And finally, we should find intermediate between reptiles and birds. We should find many, many birds that have half scales and half feathers, and their internal anatomy is halfway between the two. If evolution is true, there should be observable evidence to support these claims. Well, let's see what our National Academy of Sciences has to say about this. I call this the fossil record in education. And this is what the National Academy of Sciences stated in their book, Science and Creationism. So many intermediate forms have been discovered between fish and amphibians, between amphibians and reptiles, between reptiles and mammals, and along the primate lines of descent, that it is often difficult to identify categorically when the transition occurs from one to another species. Wow! Right there, they're making this claim that there are many, many intermediates. Everywhere we look, we should find intermediates. That's what the National Academy of Sciences has claimed. Now, is this claim true? Well, before we answer that, let's go to one of our biology textbooks and see what they're stating there. And this is out of a 2001 biology textbook. And it says this, fossils offer the most direct evidence that evolution takes place. Fossils, therefore, provide an actual record of Earth's past life forms. Change over time, meaning evolution, can be seen in the fossil record. Now, is this true? They seem to be agreeing with the National Academy of Sciences. So where do we start to examine these claims? Well, we start by weighing the facts. What we will do is weigh the claims of the Bible against the claims of evolution. Are there intermediates out there, transitional forms, to support the evolution model? Well, let's start here. What I've had pictured up here is a whole geologic history of this Earth based on the evolution model. This is our geologic time scale. And according to the evolution's model, we should find creatures all up and down this geologic column here. We should find the simplest on the bottom, and we should see a gradual progression all the way up, going from very simple single-cell organisms all the way up to creatures we have living today. Gradual progression. Many, many intermediates, many transitional forms. Remember the National Academy of Sciences said we should find so many we can't tell where one starts and the other one leads off. Now, is that true? Well, let's go all the way down to the bottom of this geologic time scale. All the way down to the Precambrian and Cambrian eras. Now, the Precambrian, according to evolutionists, occurred about 650 to 544 million years ago. Then the Cambrian period existed for about 544 to about 505 million years ago. That's based on the evolutionist time scale. Now, during this time, in the Precambrian, we have all these single-celled organisms. If evolution is true, we should find many, many transitions leading up to the Cambrian. Because in the Cambrian, we find very complex creatures like jellyfish and trilobites and creatures like that. We should find these transitions. Well, let's see. First of all, the Cambrian explosion, which is called biology's Big Bang, is the sudden appearance of many complex creatures. Notice that word, sudden appearance. This entire period lasted, this transition lasted between 5 and 10 million years. And during that time, in the Cambrian period, every major body plan suddenly appears. And these body plans, these designs, still exist today. In other words, we go from single-celled organisms all the way up to very complex creatures with no transitions. Now, if evolution is true, they must be able to produce the evidence. Because if they can't, that means their whole foundation of the fossil record is false. And if the foundation is not there, we don't even need to go anywhere else. Because that means their entire model is now based on faith, not science. Now, this chart here. Based on the evolution model, we're going to compare evidence against evolution here. On the left-hand side, I have a time scale. On the bottom, I have morphology, the shape. Now, if Darwinian model is true, we should start from a single cell and gradually produce this tree going up to the Cambrian era. We should have this many, many transitions going all the way up to give us all these major body plans we have in existence today. This is if evolution is true. 
If Darwinian evolution is true, we should find these intermediates from single cell going all the way up to the Cambrian. But in fact, this is what we actually observe. Again, every major body plan, complex creatures suddenly showing up in the fossil record with no transitions. Sudden appearance of complex creatures. That clearly supports created after their kind. Now, at this point, we don't really need to go any further in the fossil record. We will. We're going to continue. But from an argumentative point of view, from a discussion point of view, this is where evolution ends. They have no foundation for what they're teaching. And if there's no foundation, why should I accept the evolution model when they can't produce the evidence? I already have a faith. Why should I accept your faith? You see, that's what we need to be doing here. The evolution model clearly shows they have to have faith here. They have no foundation. Let's see what the scientists have to say. David Berlinski writes in his book, A Tour of the Calculus. Now, he's an evolutionist, says this. There is no question that such gaps exist. A big gap appears at the beginning of the Cambrian explosion over 500 million years ago when the great numbers of new species, get this, suddenly appeared in the fossil record. Ariel Roth, PhD in zoology in his book Origins, writes this. The Cambrian explosion is not just a case of all the major animal phyla appearing at about the same place in the geologic column. It is also a situation of no ancestors to suggest how they might have evolved. In other words, where are the thousands and thousands and thousands of observable intermediate or transitional forms? See, this is the foundation of evolution again. If they can't produce the observable evidence, why should we accept evolution? I already have a faith. Why should I accept another faith called evolution when you can't supply the evidence? Now here's a book, textbook. Biology, Miller and Devine, 2002. They state this. The Cambrian period, which begins 544 million years ago, is marked by an abundance of different fossils. Why the difference from earlier periods? And they state, by the Cambrian period, some animals had evolved shells, skeletons, and other hard body parts. Folks, you go through this book, you will not see one transition form to support this model. What they have done in this textbook is made a great claim without producing any real evidence. That is called faith. And we are allowing faith, a religious faith called evolution, to be taught in this country, in our public schools, in a science classroom. So what do the facts support? At this area, the foundation, the facts support all creatures were created after their kind because no one has been able to find the thousands and thousands and thousands of intermediates that should be out there between the Precambrian and the Cambrian. So let's move on up. Invertebrate to vertebrae. Where do fish come from? Again, here's an, an earlier version of the biology book by Miller and Levine. And they state this. Fishes are considered to be the most primitive living vertebrae. Similarities in structures and embryological development show that fishes and modern invertebrate chordates probably did evolve from common invertebrate ancestors that lived many millions of years ago. Notice the phrase, probably did evolve. That is not science. That is a faith-based statement. Why can't they produce the evidence? I go through all this biology textbook, I don't see one claim anywhere of an intermediate. Not one singer intermediate to support this claim in the textbook. Why is then any difference then, any different then, created after their kind? Why are we being allowed to teach one religious faith in a classroom and not all the others. Now here's a picture I took out of this biology textbook. Early fish according to the biology textbook. Now here's the question. How in the world do you get a jellyfish or a trilobite to evolve into one of these types of fishes without leaving a single trace of how it was done? 
No intermediates. Where are the thousands and thousands and thousands of intermediates that should be there? Darwin claimed he couldn't find any, and here we are, many hundred, almost over a hundred years later, and we still can't find any. The evidence clearly supports the biblical model of created after their kind. Ariel Roth, again, PhD in zoology, writes this. However, we have virtually no evidence in the fossil record or elsewhere for any of the changes proposed during the immensity of time, but the public hears nothing of this problem. What he is saying there is our textbooks are endorsing, the textbook writers are endorsing censorship in this country. They are endorsing a religious faith called evolution, a faith based on materialism, that there is no greater God. So the facts, again, support, clearly, created after their kind. Well, let's go to fish to amphibian now. These fish that grew legs and crawled up on the land according to evolution. Here's a, a statement of another biology textbook, and they make this statement. Because of these similarities, scientists think the first amphibians were descendants of the lobe fin fishes, a group whose modern members include the coelacanth and the lung fishes. Now notice those words, scientists think. <clears throat> now if evolution is a scientific model, why can't they say we have the evidence? And the answer is easy. They are unable to produce the evidence. Therefore, they must resort to these fuzzy words or fuzzy statements like we believe, we think, scientists think, or could possibly have been. That is not science. That is faith. <clears throat> Notice what they're saying is these lobe fin fishes, as the picture shows here, supposedly evolved legs. Well, let's take a look at one of these. The coelacanth. The coelacanth. For many, many years, claimed as the intermediate link between fish and amphibians. It was supposed to be extinct for over 70 million years. No coelacanths living on this planet for 70 million years. And the claim again was its forward fins, its lobes, were turning into legs and it was going to be an amphibian. Well, that was all nice. Until 1938, living coelacanths were found. And you know what they look like? Fish. 100% fish. Those front lobes, those front fins, were still fins. A complete misinterpretation by the evolutionist again. This must have been the dumbest fish in the world if evolution is true, because if it still looks like a coelacanth today, a fish, then it forgot how to evolve for 70 million years. What a dumb fish this thing is. But perhaps it's not so dumb after all because it clearly follows the line, the history, of created after its kind. Exactly what the Bible teaches. The fossils of the coelacanth show it was a coelacanth. The living coelacanths today confirm it is still 100% fish. Complete misinterpretation by the evolutionist. Well, let's go on up now to reptile to mammal. How do reptiles evolve into mammals? Well, let's take a look at the horse. This is a very famous one. I want to talk about a horse here. The horse is a well-documented case study in evolution. The fossil record shows clear steps in the progression from a four-toed, small, browsing animal, one of a line that gave rise to tapirs, rhinoceroses, and other mammals, in addition to horses, to the modern horse. Right out of Microsoft in Carter 2000. Now, is this statement true? Does the horse show a gradual progression supporting evolution. Well, here's life sciences, Prentice Hall. Now, I want to point something out here. In order for a model, any theory, to be valid, it has to be falsifiable. It has to be falsifiable. It means there has to be something out there that could falsify it. If there's nothing out there that can falsify a theory, it no longer qualifies as a theory. That's based on the definition of a theory. Well, let's look at what they're teaching out of this life sciences textbook. And they start off saying this about the horse. According to the theory of gradualism, new species of horses evolve slowly and continuously. Intermediate forms were common. So what they're saying there now is, in the fossil record, we should find many, many intermediates leading up to the modern-day horse. Many intermediates. They're saying it was slow 
gradual processes. Gradualism, that's based on Darwinian evolution, slow, gradual change from a common ancestor. But then a few paragraphs after that, they make this statement out of the book. According to punctuated equilibria, new species evolved rapidly during a short period of time. Intermediate forms were rare. Now they're turning right around and saying, we don't have all the intermediates because it happened so fast. Well, wait a minute. Memory of theory has to be falsifiable, doesn't it? What they're saying here is, if we find the intermediates, it supports evolution. If we don't find the intermediates, it supports evolution. It's no longer falsifiable. That means right there, this textbook just claimed that evolution cannot qualify as a theory. Isn't that great when you read things like that? Well, let's go to evolution of the horse. Jonathan Safadi, PhD in physical chemistry, writes this. As the biologist Herbert Nielsen said, the family tree of the horse is beautiful and continuous only in the textbooks. And the famous paleontologist Niles Eldridge called the textbook picture lamentable in a classical case of paleontologic museology. In other words, here's the scientists. Even the evolutionists are saying this so-called evolution of the horse is only good in textbooks, but it is not what we observe in the fossil record. Here's another one. Out of the Houston Chronicle, 1980, science editor says, the popularly told example of horse evolution suggesting a gradual sequence of changes from four-toed fox-sized creatures living nearly 50 million years ago to today's much larger one-toed horse has been known to be wrong. Transitional forms are unknown. So what do the facts support here? Well, today, we have living horses in a wide range of sizes. We have the English Shire, about six and a half feet tall, ponies under five feet, Farabella under two feet. In other words, we have small horses, medium horses, and large horses. What are we showing in the fossil record? Small horses, medium horses, large horses. What's the difference? They're still living today. We have some horses today that actually have three toes. It's possible. They have that genetic capability. It's not very common, but it does happen. There's many different varieties of horses today that exist that resemble horses in the fossil record. And when we look at the fossil record, we, we see in these museums this arrangement, also in the textbooks, of small, medium to large. But is that the order we found them in? No. That is the arbitrary order they put them in the textbooks. It's the arbitrary order they line them up in the museums. When we go out to the fossil record, what we discover is these creatures, these horses that had three toes, two toes, and one toe, were all discovered at the same geologic levers, levels in the fossil record. What does that say? They all lived at the same time. One did not evolve into the other. All that information is being kept out of our textbooks. So what do the facts support? The facts clearly support, once again, created after their kind. There are no factual intermediates leading up to the modern day horse. So let's go to this one. This is a very popular one being taught today. Reptile to bird. Reptile to bird. And here's what a biology textbook has to say about that. To many paleontologists, a bird is a dinosaur with feathers. Now wait a minute. I want to stop right there. I thought that the dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago according to the evolutionists. Now they're teaching they didn't die out. They evolved into birds. Now which story is it? Well let's continue on here. To many paleontologists a bird is a dinosaur with feathers. That definition may sound odd but it makes sense. The first fossil ever found of an early bird-like animal is in the genus Archaeopteryx and dates from late in the Jurassic period about 150 million years ago. Now that is a great claim there. That is a great claim that a reptile with scales, completely different type of internal anatomy, can change into a bird. Now in order to make that claim, they need to produce some real evidence. Well, let's take a look at another biology textbook here. Birds evolved from reptiles during the Jurassic period. So the textbooks seem to have a consensus that the dinosaurs, the small kind of dinosaurs, gradually evolved into birds and are living today. Is there any evidence to support this? Well, not according to some of the leading bird authorities. See, that one textbook said Archaeopteryx was an intermediate link. 
It's the intermediate link between reptile and birds. Half scales, half feathers. But here's what one of the leading bird authorities in the world has to say. Alan Fiducia. He says this about Archaeopteryx. Paleontologists have tried to turn Archaeopteryx into an earth-bound feathered dinosaur. But it is not. It is a bird, a perching bird. And no amount of paleobabble is going to change that. Don't you love these great scientific words, paleobabble? Because that is exactly what they're putting in our textbooks. Making a claim without being able to provide the physical evidence. Great claims require real evidence. We're being asked to believe somebody else's faith. Why should I believe evolution if they can't provide the evidence? I already have a faith. Why should I accept the faith of evolution? Now, why is Archaeopteryx called an intermediate link? Well, it had claws on its wings. Well, that doesn't really make it intermediate because we have birds living today that have claws on their wings, such as the ostrich, the Hudson, in South America. Well, it had teeth. Well, so do other bird fossils that we find. Pure bird fossils had teeth. Some reptiles have teeth, some don't. Some people have teeth and some don't. Are they evolving? So teeth are not a good idea of whether something's evolving or not. But you know, only birds have feathers. No other creature in this world has feathers, just birds. And Archaeopteryx had fully formed feathers. Here's what uh, they have to say. Barbara Stahl, Vertebrae History, writes Problems in Evolution. The imprint they left in the rock, clear and sharp, makes it evident that the feathers of Archaeopteryx were already in Jurassic time exactly like those of birds flying today. How do you go from scales on a reptile to fully formed feathers on a bird? There has to be a mechanism to have that happen. Here's something more in Archaeopteryx. Remember that one textbook author made this statement. The first fossil ever found of an early bird-like animal is in the genus Archaeopteryx and dates from late in the Jurassic period about 150 million years ago. What he's saying, this is the oldest intermediate link we found between reptile and bird. But wait a minute. Something's not right here. He's saying this is an intermediate link. But when we go to other sources, we read this. A fossil resembling a modern bird has been found in eastern Colorado in the same geologic strata as Archaeopteryx. Now hold on a minute. The textbook author said Archaeopteryx is an intermediate form. How can it be an intermediate form when we already have fully formed birds living at the same time? Why would it still be intermediate? It's not the oldest one. So the textbook author has not done his research. Then Texas Tech researchers have reported discovering birds and rocks dated much older than Archaeopteryx. Something is not right in our textbooks today. Either they're not doing their research, or they're deliberately not giving all the information. Now, let's think about this. Evolving from a reptile to a bird. The common idea is we've got to grow feathers. Well, hold on a moment. A whole lot more has to happen than that. See, birds and reptiles have complete different types of internal anatomy. There's more than just growing feathers. First of all, we do have to have development of feathers. We have to reform the re respiratory system, reform of the skeletal system, going to hollow bones for birds, reform a digestive system, reform of the nervous system, construction of bills and beaks, mastery of nest building, acquisition of flight, development of sound producing organ, and many other things have to change. Even the whole heart has to change. The circulatory system is completely different between a bird and a reptile. In a, in a reptile, they have a circulatory system much like what we do. The air comes in one set of pipes and goes back out the same set of pi pipes. But in a bird, it has more of what you call a real circulatory system. The air comes in and circulates all the way around like this and goes back out. How in the world does all those internal anatomy changes take place and that creature survive? There's no evidence this ever happened. The feather is a very complex organ, very complex organ. We have a, a central shaft going down these feathers. Then we have these barbs coming out. Then off these barbs, we have all these barbules, and then we have these hooks on there. Now, the, these feathers, they, they slide back and forth like this when that bird is moving. It slides back and forth. And when you have something sliding, it grinds on it and will gradually cause it to, to fade away or wither and fade and break. How does that bird 
keep this from happening? Well, it secretes a, a, a oily substance there to lubricate these feathers constantly. They don't talk about where that came from. Reptiles don't need that. Somewhere along the line, you've got to have this oily substance to keep those feathers from breaking apart through friction. Then just having feathers won't make a creature fly, won't make that bird fly. See, it's got to have primary feathers, but it also has to have secondary feathers to give it the lift. So it has to have all that. So how did all this happen? Well, here's the latest. I'm going to give you the latest explanation. This is what they're teaching in colleges. This is what they're teaching in some high schools, how a reptile evolved into a bird. Some of these smaller reptiles climbed up into the trees. This is the predominant theory now. They climbed up into the trees. They were jumping off these branches and trying to glide down. Well, wait a minute. How many of them went splat before they learned how to glide? And how many of them went splat before they grew feathers? And just growing five primary feathers will not make that bird fly. It's got to have the secondary feathers to give it the lift. Well, maybe they evolved the feathers, but what's going to happen? They're still going to go splat. Why? Because their bones are too heavy. They've got to have hollow bones. So you've got to have the feathers, you've got to have the hollow bones, and you have to have all the other internal anatomy changes. All this has to happen. Where is the physical evidence all this happened? It's nowhere found. In other words, what is happening is a great claim from the evolutionist without providing any of the evidence. But wait a minute, here's the evidence. We've got it out on National Geographic. National Geographic gave us all the evidence we need. 1999, October 15th, National Geographic Society and the Feathered Dinosaur Archaeoraptor. Pages and pages, even colored pictures of this intermediate to prove evolution is true. Well, let's take a look at what happened to this story. Red-faced and downhearted paleontologists are growing convinced that they have been snookered by a bit of fossil fakery from China. The feathered dinosaur specimen that they recently unveiled to much fanfare apparently combines the tail of a dinosaur with the body of a bird. Here's what happened. First thing they did wrong was smuggle the bones out of China. That's the first thing that went wrong. Second thing they did wrong was they pasted feathers onto this reptile and then claimed it was an intermediate link. That is not science. That is fraud. What did National Geographic do? Well, a couple months later, they printed out a small little article that you could barely find trying to retract it. But that didn't work. So later, a couple months after that, they printed multiple pages retracting their story. The whole thing was a fraud from the beginning. But yet, people bought into it. Wait a minute. Why? If evolution calls themselves a theory, if evolution says they're a scientific model, why must they continue to resort to false and misleading information? And the only answer we can come up with is they don't have the science to support what they're teaching. Therefore, they must continually resort to misinformation and deception via mission. Let's look at some more of these famous bird mistakes. 1993, the flightless bird on the cover of Time magazine, proving reptiles evolved into birds, turned out not to be a bird, but a theropod dinosaur. 1996, feathered fossil proves some dinosaurs evolved into birds, right out of Science magazine. The feathers turned out to be an array of fibers, nothing to do with birds. One mistake after another. People are believing in evolution. They want to believe in evolution so bad that the evidence does not matter. All that matters is that we believe in evolution. That is no longer science. That is called religious faith. 1998, China, Proto-Archaeopteryx robusta. The comment about that one is this. You have to put it in perspective. To the people who wrote this paper, the chicken would be a feathered dinosaur. If you're going to make a great claim, you have to support it with real evidence, not fraud, not mistakes, and not by omitting the evidence. And then we have this new discovery, Microraptor GUI. This is supposed to support the gliding in trees model, the one we just described. These creatures climbed up into the trees, 
glided out of the trees, and eventually their scales evolved into the feathers. There's some problems. First of all, birds already existed before this creature. So why is this one still evolving if there were already birds, according to the evolution model? Long feathers on the feet would be a hindrance. Think of this. Here's this creature, a reptile. It's got feathers all over its feet and its forelimbs. How in the world can it continue to survive? It can no longer run on the ground like it could before. It's got feathers holding it down. So it gets eaten up by its predators, and it still can't fly yet. You see, turning scales into feathers is not a benefit. It's a hindrance until you get everything there. The transitional phase would kill it. And then finally, what is the source of all this new information? It requires information to change scales into feathers. It requires information to change solid bones into hollow bones. It requires information to change all those internal anatomy structures. What is the source of all this change? What is the source of all this information? Well, A. Gibbons in Science writes this. It's biophysically impossible to evolve flight from such bipeds with foreshortened forelimbs and heavy balancing tails, exactly the wrong anatomy for flight. In other words, the creatures evolutionists are trying or supposing changed into birds are anatomically built all wrong for doing this. So the question comes down to, if you're going to make a claim that dinosaurs or reptiles evolved into birds, you must produce the thousands and thousands and thousands of intermediates to support this claim. Words in textbooks, pictures drawn by artists, do not validate their claim. It requires real evidence. So let's look at a summary of the fossil record. Ernst Marr, he is professor in the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard University. He is also hailed as the Darwin of the 20th century, one of the leading evolutionists out there. And he writes this in his book, What Evolution Is. And he starts, given the fact of evolution, notice he calls evolution a fact, one would expect the fossils to document a gradual, steady change from ancestral forms to the descendants. But this is not what the paleontologist finds. Instead, he or she finds gaps in just about every phyletic series. Now, here's the gentleman they call the Darwin of the 20th century, calling evolution a fact, but yet he is unable to document his facts. Why should I accept evolution if they can't produce the evidence? I already have a faith. Why should I change my faith? Because that's all evolution is a matter of, faith. The evidence clearly supports created after their kind. So let's go to this mechanism for change. In order to have one creature change another, such as a single cell into an invertebrate, an invertebrate into a vertebrate, a fish into amphibian, amphibian into a reptile, reptile into a bird or mammal, or an ape-like creature in a human, there has to be some mechanism that will add new information to the DNA. Because it's our DNA that has all the information in it that says what kind of creature we're going to be. For instance, humans, we have 46 chromosomes. If you want to go out there and have 16 chromosomes, you can call yourself an onion. So we have to have some form or mechanism that will add all this information to say that reptile is now going to grow feathers or that reptile is now going to get hollow bones and its whole heart is going to change, its whole circulatory system is going to change. Something has to add that information. Now before we get to that, we need to lay a foundation here. We need to understand some definitions. Because what we're seeing in the textbooks is these definitions are constantly changing. So let's lay a foundation for our definitions, then we're going to look at this mechanism for information. First thing is microevolution. Most textbooks give it a very fuzzy definition. What they're really meaning by microevolution is this, genetic variability, natural selection, but not evolution. See, some textbooks call it small changes. But what they're referring to is natural selection and genetic variability, which has nothing to do with evolution. It has everything to do with what we already have in us, the already existing information. 
God has programmed every species with genetic variability. Just look at the human species. We have people that are just under four feet to people over seven feet tall. That's genetic variability. We have people with many shades of color, light to dark, but it's only one color called melanin. That is genetic variability. We have over 200 flavors of dogs, but they're all dogs. That is genetic variability, not evolution. Then we have something called macroevolution, commonly referred to as Darwinian evolution. That is where one species will gradually change into a new species, such as a reptile into a bird or an ape-like creature into a human being. That is what we mean by macroevolution. That requires new information. Then we have the genetic variation and natural selection. That is nothing more than variability within kind. We see that in every species today. We see it in the human species, we see it in the dogs, we see it in the cats. Every species has that genetic variability. But the one we're interested in here is macroevolution because that is the one that requires new information. So let's look at this new information. What are the sources of new information? Well, the only mechanisms for change that evolution proposes are natural selection and mutations. Now, is natural selection enough to cause evolution to occur? Does natural selection cause new information? Is natural selection true? Yes, it is. We observe natural selection everywhere. It's our ability to adapt to our environment. It is also survival of the fittest. We see that all the time. In the human species, we have the ability to adapt to our environment. But can natural selection cause one kind of creature to evolve into another kind of creature called macroevolution? And the answer is no. You see, natural selection only works with existing information. It can only select from what already exists. It has never been known to add new information. And in most cases, natural selection causes a loss of information, never a gain. So it's not a mechanism to add this new information. Now here's what some scientists have had to say about natural selection. And they say, natural selection can only act on those biological properties that already exist. It cannot create properties in order to meet adaptational needs. Now what they're saying there is it does not add new information. It only selects from what already exists. Neil Broom in his book, How Blind is the Watchmaker, states, I would therefore argue that the very concept of natural selection as defined by the neo-Darwinists is fundamentally flawed. In other words, in many of our textbooks, they're trying to claim or hint that natural selection causes macroevolution to occur. No, it doesn't. It does not add new information. So let's look at these things called mutations now. This is supposed to be the source, according to evolution, that causes macroevolution to occur. What we're supposed to have here really is a mutation occurs that's supposed to benefit that organism, then through natural selection it it selects just that new mutation and deselects for everything else that programs for that particular trait. So before we can select it, we have to have a new mutation that will benefit that creature. So what do we know about mutations? Well, we know we have detrimental mutations, we know we have neutral mutations, and we know we have a few beneficial mutations. But remember now, we have to have something that's going to add new information. Let's look at these different kinds of mutations. Detrimental mutations, what do they cause? Disease, sickness, and death. So no evolution there, because once you're dead, you can't evolve anymore. We know dead things don't evolve. So detrimental mutations do not cause macroevolution. They're not a source. What about neutral mutations? Well, they cause no change. Therefore, no evolution there. So now we're down to the last line here, beneficial mutations. If we have a beneficial mutation, will it be enough to cause macroevolution? Will it be enough to cause all these new species changes? Will it be enough to grow legs on a fish? Will it be enough to turn scales into feathers? No, it won't. Because you have to have a beneficial mutation that adds information. 
Now, if you get a beneficial mutation that adds information, will that cause macroevolution to occur? And the answer is still no, because you have to have a beneficial mutation that adds information that changes the morphology of that creature. It's got to select for a new change. Just having something that's beneficial that adds information, that new information has to code for changing scales into feathers or growing legs on a fish. If it doesn't do that, macroevolution still won't occur. The only way we can have macroevolution is we have to have a beneficial mutation that adds information that codes for a morphological change. Then evolution is possible. But have we ever observed any of those? Well, let's look at some of the major claims of evolution. Let's look at some of these evidences that have been used to support evolution. Each one of these now has been examples used in textbooks to support evolution. First one is called the peppered moth. Well, before the turn of the 20th century, back in the 1800s, we have all these peppered moths. And we have light-colored pepper moths, and we have dark-colored pepper moths. And the story goes that these peppered moths landed on these trees. That was the story. We found out that might not even be true either. They landed on these trees. And these trees were very light in color. And the birds liked to come down and eat these peppered moths. So which ones do they see? Well, the light ones are camouflaged on the light trees, so the birds are eating up all the dark ones. So we have a large population of light-colored moths. Then the Industrial Revolution comes along, putting out all this soot and carbons, and it comes onto the trees and gets into the trees and turns these trees a little darker. Now the dark-colored pepper moths are better camouflaged. So what do the birds see? The light ones. So they start eating up all the light ones. Now we have a larger population of dark pepper moths. So we have a population shift. Is that evolution? No, it is not has nothing to do with evolution. They started off as peppered moths, and they ended up as peppered moths, light and dark colored. All we have was a population shift. That's nothing more than natural selection, survival of the fittest. Nothing to do with evolution. So a false evidence there. And then we have Darwin's finches, his birds. When he went off to the Galapagos Islands, he found these finches, different kinds of finches, isolated. Isolated populations of finches. He saw finches with short beaks, fat beaks, long beaks. Right, there's this book out called The Beak of the Finch now. It talks all about this. You start in page one, it talks about finches. You get to the last page, guess what they're still talking about? Finches. They're still 100% finches. They're still 100% birds. And their claim was these, these isolated populations of finches with different kinds of beaks did not mate. Well, we found out many years ago that was false. They did mate, and they did produce fertile offspring, but that has been left out of our textbooks completely left out of the textbooks. We started with finches, we ended up with finches. That is not macroevolution, that is natural selection. And then we have the fruit fly, famous case of the fruit fly, Drosphelia. People like to use this experiment because it has a very fast gestation period. It's here and it's gone. It doesn't last many days. And they go off and bombard this fruit fly with x-rays and, and to try and form these mutations to see if they can come out with anything better. What did they end up with all these simulation of millions of years of mutations? They ended up with fruit flies with long wings, short wings, fat wings, no wings, red eyes. All they ended up with was deformed fruit flies incapable of surviving any better. So again, nothing new there. Then the best one they have today is bacteria resistance to antibiotics. The claim now is we spray these, these bacteria with all our modern antibiotics and they turn around and laugh at us now. They're, they're resistant. They all of a sudden become resistant. And that's proof that they're changing into something new. No, it is not. It has nothing to do with macroevolution. See, the, these, this resistance in most all cases is not due to mutations. See, most resistance is due to complex enzymes that inactivate the poison. It's really mostly done at the enzyme level, not at the mutation level. Now, there are some observed cases of spontaneous mutations which help cause this resistance. But in no case did it really add any new information, nor did it code for any morphological change. So no evolution there. We're being taught wrong information again. The whole history of evolution seems to rely on teaching misleading information or leaving information out. And in some cases, this resistance was already present. And they just don't account for that. See, none of these are examples of evolution. They're all examples of genetic variation 
and natural selection. So, are there any beneficial mutations that have added information? Jonathan Wells, PhD in molecular biology, states this. But there is no evidence that DNA mutations can provide the sorts of variation needed for evolution. There is no evidence for beneficial mutations at the level of macroevolution. But there is also no evidence at the level of what's commonly regarded as microevolution. Here's a molecular biologist saying there are no beneficial mutations that have added information. None whatsoever. You know what that means? That means evolution is completely without a mechanism. Then why should I accept evolution if they can't supply the evidence? I already have a faith. Why should I change my faith for a model that can't supply any evidence? Then we have people like Maxim D. Frank Kamineski in his book, Unraveling DNA. Now he's a professor at Brown University, Center for Advanced Biotechnology and Biomedical Engineering. And this is what he has to state about this. Mutations are rare phenomena, and a simultaneous change of even two amino acid residues in one protein is totally unlikely. Now here's what he's saying here. We've got to get all these mutations, but we've got to have beneficial related mutations. You can't just have a mutation here and one over here and say you're going to have all this evolution. They have to be beneficial related mutations. And he's saying just to get two amino acids in the same protein is almost totally unlikely. And then he goes on to say this. One could think, for instance, that by constantly changing amino acids one by one, it will eventually be possible to change the entire sequence substantially. And then he says, these minor changes, however, are bound to eventually result in a situation in which the enzyme has ceased to perform its previous function, but has not yet begun its new duties. It is at this point it will be destroyed along with the organism carrying it. Now here's what he's saying. Let's go back to that reptile to bird. When that reptile's got half scales and half feathers, how viable is it? It can no longer maneuver on the ground. It can't do its previous function very well anymore. And it still can't do its new function of flying. Is at that point, its predators are going to gobble it up and it's all gone. You see, it doesn't work. The evolution model does not work. All the scientific evidence shows it can't happen. Then we have Lee Spentner, PhD in physics from MIT, taught information and communications at John Hopkins University, worked in the biomedical field, and this is what he has to say about mutations. But in all the reading I've done in the life sciences literature, I've never found a mutation that added information. All point mutations that have been studied on the molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information and not increase it. Evolution is without a mechanism. Ernst Chain, biochemist and Nobel Prize winner, states that the development and survival of the fittest is entirely a consequence of chance mutations, or even that nature carries out experiments by trial and error through mutations in order to create living systems better suited to survive, seems to be a hypothesis based on no evidence. The evolution model, again, is without a mechanism. So let's summarize what we've seen so far. The intermediates required for evolution do not exist. All we see are claims in textbooks, but great claims require real evidence. The fossil record clearly supports the biblical model of created after their kind. Natural selection and mutations are not mechanisms for evolutionary change. So what does all this mean now? It means there must be another explanation for what we see in the fossil record, because evolution's explanation does not fit what we observe. And then explanation comes right out of the Bible, Genesis 6, verse 17, where it says, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth, to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. That is the explanation for what we see in the fossil record. Everything created after their kind, Everything buried at about the same time. So why do people ignore God's word when it clearly fits the evidence? Well, John 3.12 says this. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? God has given us all the evidence. Romans 1, 19 and 20 tells us God has given us all the evidence. We have no excuse for not believing. So why do people not believe? 
Well, 2 Peter 3, verses 5 and 6 tell us why people don't believe. And it states this. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. People are willingly rejecting the evidence. People are willingly rejecting God's word to buy into a concept or religious faith called evolution. So in conclusion, the Bible teaches that God is the creator of all things. The Bible clearly teaches God created all creatures after their kind, and each one of these kinds has genetic variability. So why do people believe what they believe? A lot of times it's peer pressure. If you choose not to accept evolution, you might be ostracized. They want to agree with the majority. Personal opinion and pride many times causes us to believe what we believe. Sometimes people believe the scientific evidence without even examining the scientific evidence. And some people choose to believe God's word created after their kind. But ultimately, it is your choice what you want to believe. It's your choice what you want to believe. And again, there's only two choices in this whole matter. One choice is you can put your entire faith and hope in God's word, what he has to tell us, that he sent his only begotten son down to this planet as a man to suffer and die on a cross. He shed his blood so that we might have hope. You see, the Bible offers hope. God's word offers hope. That whoever believeth in him shall have everlasting life. It is not an intellectual concept here. It is a heart condition, folks. We've seen the evidence does not support evolution. So the evidence does not matter here. What matters is, ultimately, what is your relationship with Jesus Christ? That's your one choice you have. What's your relationship with him? Your other choice is this. You can put your entire hope in eternity into a man by the name of Charles Darwin who lived, died, and stayed dead. Those are your two choices.